I've studied this ball for most of my life. The placement of the laces, the tightness of a spiral pass, velocity, acceleration, torque, striving for a total grasp of the subject. I've learned and taught so much about the unique magic of the American football. And still, after all these years, there was one question I couldn't answer. My name is Dr. Timothy Gay. I knew I wanted to be a physicist when I was in third grade, and football's been a part of my life even longer. Watching those NFL films highlights in the church basement after a potluck supper, I was mesmerized by the tight spiral coming right at me, as if I could reach out my hands and catch it. I wasn't good enough to make my prep school football team, but I'll tell you someone who was. I call him Bill, but to most, he's Coach Belichick. I got to know Bill during my two years at Phillips Academy, where I served officially as the team's manager and unofficially as its football physicist. In 1993, these two passions collided head on when I began teaching physics here at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. We experience time in a completely different way than we experience space. It was a far cry from my own college experience at Caltech, where the standard student uniform was pocket protectors and thick glasses. You see, the football team at Caltech was notoriously bad, so bad that even I could make it. In Nebraska, football is a way of life. I was in heaven. And I was a shameless self-promoter, so I couldn't have said yes fast enough when Nebraska's video team asked me if I teach a football physics class at every home game. If Isaac Newton's lab was the model of scholarly isolation, I'd begun teaching the world's largest physics class. Football physics with UNL physics professor, Dr. Tim Gay. 90,000 students listened intently as I explained how vectors can help predict the direction of a rollout pass or how good footing on a tackle creates enough downward force to transmit a huge hit. The best way to teach science is to relate it to something people actually care about, and what a lot of people care about, especially in Nebraska, is football. Something tells me I'd better tackle a different topic today. In 2005, I took everything I'd learned and put it into a book. I even got my buddy Bill to write the introduction. The line of scrimmage. Things were really taking off. An area of battle where the game can be won or lost. But after all the lectures and lessons, there was still that one question I couldn't answer. And it came back to the thing that had captivated me in the first place, the perfect spiral pass. Is there a more beautiful sight in all of sports? If you get a bunch of physicists in a room, this is the question that confounds them. None of us could make sense of why the ball does what it does in the air. So perfect, and to me, so vexing. Here's the problem. When the quarterback throws the ball, it's pitched up. It spirals as it moves down the field, but when it's caught, it's pitched down. Common sense and simple physics would seem to dictate that the ball should tumble end over end as it moves through the pass, or that it should maintain a fixed axis as it was thrown as it moves to the receiver. For years, I couldn't figure it out. Why does the football make that perfect rainbow? I enlisted the help of colleagues from around the country. Finally, in 2020, after nearly two decades, we found the answer. It all comes back to a simple, overlooked physics principle gyroscopic precession. It's something kids learn about intuitively when they spin a top or a dreidel. If I put one end of a football on a table, tilt it, and then release it, it falls over. But if I take the ball and spin it up and release it from an angle as before, the ball doesn't fall over its tip executes a circular motion about a vertical line. A tight spiral pass turns over for the same reason that the point of our spinning football on the tabletop processes around the center. The gist of it is air drag takes the place of our tabletop, defining a new center about which the ball processes. 
It's a lot more complicated than that, but in the interest of time, I'll spare you the details. It's published all right here in the American Journal of Physics. As a scientist, solving a problem that's plagued you for years is like, well, winning the Super Bowl. Practice makes perfect. Actually, practice does not make perfect. Only perfect practice makes perfect. Vince Lombardi said that. He also said, they call it coaching, but it's teaching. You do not just tell them, you show them the reasons. Eric's hand puts spin on the ball to stabilize it in flight for maximum yardage. Unfortunately, understanding the theoretical principle of symmetry doesn't guarantee instant success as a quarterback. <laughs> hey, Doc, you got a chance to evaluate your arm, and uh, I think you're better suited for the offensive line. Hey, Doc, thanks for all that science you taught me. You still got it, Eric. I'm often asked if the things I've learned over the years can give a team the upper hand. Can they influence who will win? The short answer is no. The long answer, well, that's a lecture in itself. You see, most of this is instinctive to football players. They are truly intuitive when it comes to the big hits, the long throws, the short bursts of speed. The game's greatest coaches and players know how to use physics to their advantage, even if they know nothing about physics itself. You'll appreciate the game more if you understand the science behind it. In all my years immersed in the game of football, I've never run out of a mammoth-sized tunnel. I've never thrown the biggest okay. block or scored the winning touchdown and heard the roar of 90,000 fans. But up on those jumbotrons, I got to be their physics teacher. That was even better. Yeah.